Dirty Dozen Eclipse Predictions for the April 8, 2024 Total Solar Eclipse. Nautical Almanac plus High School Geometry equals Eclipse? Too long, didn't read. I'm not an astronomer, and I did not consult with anyone on this video. I simply wanted to challenge myself to see how much I could predict about a solar eclipse using only high school geometry, starting with the Nautical Almanac. And I did it. Now I extend the challenge to you. Can you predict 12 aspects of the upcoming eclipse based on either the heliocentric model or the flat earth model? At the time of this recording, December 2023, it's well known that a narrow strip of the United States will have a total solar eclipse on April 8th, 2024, just over three months from now. Let's turn it into a geometry problem. Flat Earth folks claim that eclipses work just fine with the geometry of a level plane. Globe folks say that's impossible. So I've got a challenge for both Flat Earth folks and Globe folks. Can you predict a list of 12 values based on your model using only high school geometry? That's why I'm calling it the Dirty Dozen, since I'm not going to permit any sophisticated tools. No spherical geometry, no ephemeris tables, no Habersigns and Vincenti, but you may use GeoGebra to help you visualize, you just may not use any of GeoGebra's measuring tools. You may also store your, uh, store your calculations in a spreadsheet for ease of use. More on that at the end. Let's begin by talking about three concepts that get casually tossed around in this arena with regards to eclipses. Is it really the moon, the Saros cycle, and reverse engineering? One of the main purposes of my YouTube channel is to encourage folks to go outside and carefully study the heavens. The sky is free, and anyone is free to make careful observations, including the pattern of the moon in the days leading up to an eclipse. Here we see the position of the moon at 0 hours, 12 hours noon, and 24 hours universal time uh, for April, 20, April 1st, 2024. Obviously, during the day, you can't see the stars, but if you get up early before sunrise, you can confirm that on April 1st, the moon is is in Sagittarius. You just need to expose for the stars, not the bright waning crescent moon. Now if we keep the sun in the same place on screen, we can advance up to the date of the eclipse. Notice the daily motion of the moon in red. If we zoom in on the date of April 8th, we can see that the moon will catch up to the sun in the sky between noon and midnight universal time. We can also notice that folks who are in the path of totality with dark skies the moment of the eclipse will also see Venus, Saturn, and Mars nearby. So yes, it is actually the moon we see blocking the sun during a solar eclipse. Saros Cycles Solar eclipses have a pretty wide variety of geometries on the surface of Earth, as shown with this map of two decades of eclipses ending in 2020. The Saro cycle refers to the continuously overlapping series of eclipses which have roughly similar geometry. The Saro cycle has a period of 18 years, 11 days, 8 hours, and members of one cycle will have similar geometries. Because of the 8 hours apart, uh, eight hours part, two consecutive eclipses in one Saros cycle will be offset by one third of the planet. I road tripped with my family down to South Carolina in August 2017 to see a total solar eclipse, which was the 22nd eclipse of Saros 145. The 21st or previous eclipse of Saros 145 was in 1999, shown here. The accusation is that globe folks simply follow a pattern shown by Mother Nature and that we're not really predicting anything. Let's pull on this thread a bit. This means that the eclipse that I saw in Columbia, South Carolina, with umbra totality predicted down to the second, was merely based on the exact path of the 1999 eclipse through eastern Turkey. Let's take this one step further. The upcoming eclipse of 
April 2024, will be the 30th eclipse of Saros 139. According to the accusation, it should be predicted based on the previous eclipse, the 29th eclipse of Saros 139. Would you feel confident in your predictions based on this path? In this challenge, I am going to encourage you to use geometry skills to predict exact values, not just copy the previous Saros 139 eclipse. Next we have reverse engineering. This is the practice of taking an existing piece of technology and analyzing it so that its design can be ascertained, working backwards from how it was built in the first place. The accusation against globe folks is that we take our real-world observations and then reverse engineer a fictitious globe by rigging the numbers so that the math all works out. The problem is that this is not how anything works in the real world, as seen by this quote from Ben Lutkovich. Reverse engineering is the act of dismantling an object to see how it works. You need to start with a working model. Reverse engineering cannot produce deception for something that doesn't exist or even work. Let's see an example of this accusation in action. In the real world, we see the full moon take up about half a degree of angular size. Let's pretend the moon is 3,500 kilometers in diameter, and let's use an angular size calculator. We can then declare the moon to be 400,000 kilometers away, and the math all works out. Of course, the moon could really be 35 kilometers in size, and then it would be 4,000 kilometers away. You could then extend this to the sun, knowing that it also takes up about half a degree in the sky. Sure, you could make up a series of numbers, but as soon as you tried to make unrelated observations, for example, the width of a solar eclipse umbra, it would break your initial fake values. This is not reverse engineering, this is deception, and it is impossible to pull off. In this challenge, I am asking Flat Earth folks to try to do what they accuse Globe Earth folks of doing. Make up the numbers so that they work in your favor, so the end result matches real-world observations. Or in this case, so that your numbers will match a very well-cataloged description of a future solar eclipse. You can pick any numbers you like for sizes and distances of sun and moon, and then even invent your own phenomena, such as light bending through the firmament. You may take anything into account using your own definitions, such as perspective, convergence, the Rayleigh criterion, and the way our eyes, eyes work. Nothing is off the table. Meanwhile, this challenge is going to force globe folks to work with one arm timed behind your backs, using only the methods of high school geometry. We'll start with this table from the 2024 Nautical Almanac. Since the sextant and celestial navigation became a hot topic of conversation in this arena several years ago, the consensus view among Flat Earth folks is that celestial navigation using the Nautical Almanac works just fine. So, we'll start here. A link to the exact Almanac PDF is in the description. If you study this table very carefully, can you see the solar eclipse? Here are all the materials that you need for this challenge. The skills from high school geometry include rules for triangles, circles, and parallel lines, right triangle trigonometry, the law of sines, and the law of cosines. Because I'm not permitting the use of ephemeris tables, the distance values for the sun and moon are for the exact values for location x at peak totality. Describe next. So here's the challenge scenario. While the actual eclipse will last several hours, there is one location on Earth, location X, where the center of the eclipse will cross the observer's meridian. In other words, an observer at location X in the United States will see peak totality in the southern sky at exactly 180 degrees azimuth due south. Every aspect of the dirty dozen refers to the exact moment in time when location X is at peak totality, centered inside the umbra. What are the latitude and longitude of location X? What is the exact time of this event using universal time, UT? What's the angle of elevation of the eclipse for location X? 
what's the sun-moon apparent size ratio? It should be a value bigger than 1. If it were less than 1, it would be an annular eclipse. How wide is the umbra, measured east to west? Being that the moon's shadow is circular, but the eclipse is not at the observer's zenith, the circle will turn into an oval. So our next question is, how tall is the umbra, measured north to south? What's the path angle of the umbra, measured counterclockwise from due east? In this fake example, the eclipse is headed northwest, but you'll have to figure out the true angle. What's the path width of the umbra? In other words, how wide a swath of countryside is the umbra cutting at the moment it crosses location X's meridian? What's the ground speed of the umbra as it travels this path? How long will totality last at location X? And lastly, most of the United States will see at least a partial eclipse. What's the size of the penumbra when location X is at peak totality? In other words, outside the penumbra boundary, the sun is not obscured at all at this moment in time. Technically, just like the umbra, the penumbra is not circular either. So you could break it down into north-south height and east-west width. If you get this far, you can call it the dirty baker's dozen. If you'd like a tutorial on terms like umbra and penumbra, which can apply either to a globe earth or a flat earth solar eclipse, please check out my video from 2017, made in anticipation of the August eclipse of that year. It's part of a trilogy of videos I made on eclipses that year. Being that the challenge is really about producing procedures and geometry to predict what will happen in the real world on April 8th, 2024, I'm going to give you an answer key so you can check your work. When I teach math, I'm almost always giving my students the answer key to a set of problems that they're working on. As a math teacher, my focus is on my students learning the procedure, so I'll happily give them the final answers for free. But just as I don't permit my students to just give me the final answer, I'm most interested in your procedures. How did you arrive at your final values? If you go to Larry Cohn's excellent website, shadowandsubstance.com, you'll find many helpful eclipse visualizations. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll find a link to Xavier Hubier's Encyclopedic Eclipse Map with all the data with high precision. Links to both will be in the description. When my family and I road trip down to Columbia, South Carolina in August 2017, we used Xavier's map to help plan our destination. His map predicted the time and duration of totality down to the second. I'll be using his April 2024 map as the official answer key for this challenge. Now, I've gone ahead and done everything I'm asking you folks to do, at least from a heliocentric perspective. Over the coming months, I'll reveal my methods, but here's a blurry view of my spreadsheets. My final answers were very close to the values found in Xavier's map and data. Can you do as well as me? I'm talking to you, Globe folks. Spreadsheets like Google Sheets are great for automating calculations so that we can change the inputs and the outputs will be automatically recalculated. You can also cascade calculations, letting the result of one function feed into the input of another, as shown here in a series of calculations where I found the umbral path angle. Here's a quick two-minute spreadsheet demo for how we can use radius to compute several aspects of a sphere. It's always good to label your cells so you can read your spreadsheet. So we'll start with a radius of 1 in cell A1, and we'll label it radius in cell B2. B1. So we've just labeled it radius. We're going to type 1. That's going to be the base of our calculations. Now we want to find the diameter. So we start with an equal sign, 2 times, and we can type A1. So that's going to take the value of the radius. And we'll label this cell uh, diameter. Next we want to find the circumference. And circumference is pi times the diameter. So again, we're going to start with an equal sign, and then we're going to type in pi. That's a function times, and this time I'm going to click on cell A2. If you click on cell A2, it types A2 automatically. It saves a little bit of time. 
Now, before we go on, we're actually going to rename cell A1 with the word radius. We're renaming the cell so that we don't have to keep typing A1 over again. We just type the word radius. So now we're going to find the volume of a sphere. Now, the volume of a sphere is equals 4 thirds times pi times the radius cubed. So when we type times, we're going to type the word radius. We're not going to type A1 anymore. We're literally going to type the word radius to make this formula easy to read. Radius cubed, radius to the third power. Now the last thing we're going to do is find surface area, which is 4 pi r squared. So again, we start with an equal sign, and we're going to do 4 times pi times, and again, we're going to type in the word radius because that's going to pull in the value from cell A1, radius squared, radius, radius to the second power. Okay, now it computes that. Now the nice thing is, now that we've done this whole thing, we can change the radius to say five, and it will recalculate everything for us. It's pretty amazing how spreadsheets work. My next video will comprise the official answer key for the challenge. Now I've told you where to go yourself, but I didn't want to give you all the answers just yet. It's fun to discover them on your own. Now then, over the coming weeks and months, I'll walk everyone through the geometry of each of my solutions to the dirty dozen using the heliocentric model. I hope a bunch of Flat Earth folks and Globe folks will take on this challenge and post their results as well. Now doing all 12 might be a steep climb, so don't feel obligated. It might just be fun to do a handful for a smaller challenge. Now remember, Flat Earth folks have been saying for years that there's no problem with a total solar eclipse on an Earth, which is not a globe. Now's your chance to prove it. Can you show us all how it's done and compute the dirty dozen so that the results of your calculations match reality? This challenge is also open to globe folks who might find it fun to try to use a hammer and chisel to manually do what is normally done with extensive ephemeris tables and astronomical algorithms developed over centuries. Please share this with your flat earth and globe earth friends, especially the folks who are technically minded. It would be great to see a wide variety of folks attempting this challenge, if only for bragging rights. Speaking of bragging rights, can you be the first to write a comment naming the Easter egg that I've hidden in this video? That about wraps up this challenge. Special thanks to my channel supporters, Johnny Ragadoo and Luke Filewalker, and rest in peace, Jim Jackson. As always, please be kind to each other in the comments. Bye.